So the first half of this video is good for my intro students to watch and the uh, second half and the first half is uh, recommended for my logic students. Um, so when you look at this screen you can see a bunch of different uh, vocab words from logic and if you're reading a logic book they're kind of intimidating. You know you have valid, invalid, sound, unsound and so on but all of this reduces to a simple distinction. So first we'll practice the distinction and then I'll explain what all these words mean, a simple way to remember them. Okay, And so first thing to remember is that there's two ways that arguments go bad. First, the premises may be false, right? And second, you may have a faulty inference. So you can say every argument, if it has a problem, it either has a problem with the facts or the reasoning from the facts. That is, with the premises or the inference from the premises. So on this screen, you can see an argument that has a faulty premise, all whales are dogs, but it has a good inference. And the way I know it's a good inference is because if I assume the premises are true, all whales are dogs and all cats are whales, then the conclusion must follow. So it's a good inference. Um, look at the other one. It has The second argument has a good premise but a faulty inference. And that's because all dogs are animals and Lassie is an animal are true. So it has good premises, true premises. But it has a faulty inference because it, when I assume those premises are true, the conclusion doesn't follow because there's many uh, non-animal um, I'm sorry, non-dog animals like uh, cats. So you can't infer that all dogs are an you can't infer from all dogs are animals, and, and Lassie is an animal that Lassie is a dog. <laughs> okay. Now um, on this screen, you can see how to evaluate any argument. First, you want to evaluate the inference, right? So you assume the premises are true, even if you know they aren't, and you ask, do the assumed premises provide good reasons for believing the conclusion? And if they um, do, the inference is good. If they don't, the inference is poor. And then you go to the premises and say, are these true or reasonable? All right? And that's it. That's how you evaluate arguments. So in this screen, you get some practice. right? And um, the first argument is um, has good premises, but it has a faulty inference. Right? You cannot infer that Shamu is a whale from the facts that Shamu is a mammal and all whales are mammals. This is because saying all whales are mammals is not equivalent to saying all mammals are whales. When we assert that all whales are mammals, there may be many mammals that are not whales, and Shamu could be one of those non-whale mammals. Right? It's harder to talk it out. It's easier to see it in form. Uh, look at number two. This inference is good because the conclusion must follow if we assume the premises are true. However, you would still reject this argument because the first premise, all whales are cats, is obviously false. Look at argument three. This one has a bad premise but a good inference. It's a good inference because the conclusion must be true if we suppose the premises are true. The facts and premises are bad, but the inference is good. Number four has a dubious premise, namely all people are selfish. That's kind of debatable, but it has a good inference because if you assume that, um, um, then the conclusion must follow that you are selfish. Uh, number five, this has a reasonable premise, but the inference is faulty. So even if we assume that Hitler was bad, the conclusion doesn't follow because Hitler obviously held some true beliefs, like two plus two equals four, the world isn't flat, or automobiles exist. So this is sort of an ad hominem or guilt by association fallacy, right? Reasonable premise, but faulty inference. Number six has a false premise, but a good inference. And uh, number seven, this premise might be true for some person out there with very narrow experiences, right? But the inference is bad. So the conclusion, all redheads are mean and stinky, doesn't really follow even if we assume the premise is true. Namely, that I've met three mean and stinky redheads, right? So in this case, I'm generalizing from a sample that's too small. It's a hasty generalization fallacy. So the premise might be true, but the inference is still uh, bad. Now, uh, number eight would be a true conclusion and a bad inference, a very bad one. You wonder what this person uh, was smoking, right? Mm -hmm. um, because the conclusion, fire trucks make noises, doesn't follow from the premises, even when we uh, assume that the premises are true. And we could call this a non sequitur fallacy. It just doesn't follow. Okay, so when you now that you had some practice evaluating arguments by using this two-pronged strategy, it's helpful to think of the possible results of your evaluation and you can see them on this screen here. So when you evaluate arguments, it's not enough to examine the truth of the premises. You should also examine the inference, the structure, the form, the reasoning, right? And if you disagree with the argument, be very specific about whether you disagree with the premises or the inference. That will help clarify our thinking and improve our discussions. Now, one of the most common logical mistakes is thinking you have a good argument simply because you have all the facts. 
But the facts are not enough because you still need to draw good inferences from those facts. You still need to reason well. So many highly intelligent people work hard to discover facts, but then draw sloppy inferences from those facts. And so this is another reason logic is valuable. Okay, so let's move to the logic, the formal logic part. And on this slide, you can see a chart um, that I drew and paint. I tried to draw. <laughs> okay. Um, and remember, there's two types of arguments: deductive and inductive. You can see uh, my other video to review those. Now let's start with deductive. When you evaluate the inference in a deductive argument, we say the inference is good. And instead of saying a deductive inference is good, we say it's valid. And if the inference is bad, we say it's invalid. Now if the inference is good, that is, it's valid, and it has true premises, we say the deductive argument is sound. But if it's valid, the inference is good, so it's valid, and it has false premises, we say it's unsound. So all of these words are just coming from those two ways to evaluate arguments. So take a look on this screen. Uh, we see two arguments and try evaluating them and using the vocab that you can see in that little chart I put in the right corner. Now the first argument is value, uh, valid because it's impossible for the conclusion to be false if you assume the premises are true. Right? Now you may, so the inference is good. You may object to this argument because the first premise is obviously false. But it's important to remember that validity is an evaluation of the inference, not the premises. Therefore, this argument is valid. Okay, And uh, we could also say that this argument is unsound, because it has a good inference, but it has false premises. So it's valid, but unsound. And the false premise would be all philosophers are cartoon characters. right? <laughs> okay, and the second argument is about, about Lassie. Now, in this case, it's easy to assume the premises are true, because they are true. You know, all dogs are animals, and Lassie is an animal. It's true. Still, the argument is invalid because the true conclusion does not follow from the true premises. That is, this inference is bad, right? And uh, so, for example, imagine that all dogs really are animals, and Lassie is an animal, but I just so happen to call my cat Lassie. Right? The fact that something is an animal doesn't mean it's a dog. So even if we assume the premises are true here, the conclusion doesn't follow, so we say it's a faulty inference. And since it's a faulty inference in a deductive argument, we say it's invalid. And every invalid deductive argument is also considered unsound. So you can say it's invalid or unsound, either one. All right. And um, let's look at this argument. This is an example of a valid and sound argument. And it says all dogs are animals, Lassie is a dog. So those are both true, right? And Lassie is an animal. That does follow from those two um, uh, premises. Um, <clears throat> it's impossible, in this case, for the conclusion to be false if the premises are true in this deductive argument. So we say that the inference is good, the premises are true, so this is a sound argument. And you could say that it's valid and sound, but sound captures the idea that it's both valid and has true premises. So instead of saying valid and sound, you can just drop the valid and say sound. <laughs> okay. Now let's look at inductive arguments. Um, and you have the same sort of thing going on, but remember with inductive arguments, we claim the conclusion probably follows, not that it must follow from the premises. Um, so in inductive arguments, let's see here. Every Texas summer is the one you see on the screen. For the last 300 years has been hot, so the next summer will probably be hot. This is an inductive argument, and you want to ask, if we assume the premise is true, we're evaluating the inference, right? So if you assume the premise is true, does the conclusion probably follow? And I think the answer here is yes. So this is a good inference for inductive arguments, and therefore we say, instead of a good inference, we say it has a strong inference. It's a strong inductive argument. And then this premise also happens to be true. We have really good reasons for believing every Texas summer for the last 300 years has been hot. Therefore, it's a strong inductive argument with true premises, so it's cogent. Look at the next argument. It says men produce the last 300 movies, so the next one will surely be produced by a man. If we assume the premise is true, the conclusion really is well supported. So this is a strong inductive argument. However, the premise is false. Men produce the last 300 movies, and so we say it's strong but uncogent because it has false premises. Okay, so there is something wrong with that one. Okay, so 
on the next slide we have another um, inductive argument about Rex and how he's from Texas and wears cowboy boots and chews tobacco so he um, so Samuel who um, is also from Texas probably wears cowboy boots and chews tobacco <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. so let's assume the premise is true first let's evaluate the inference um, we assume it's true does the conclusion follow is it well supported and I think the answer is obviously no right just because one Texan does that does, doesn't mean all do right so we say that this inductive argument is weak and since it's weak we don't we can just say it's uncogent all weak inductive arguments are uncogent so that argument is uncogent even though it has a true premise okay. All right, so, oh, I got two more. Uh, the last 30 U.S. presidents have been women, so the next U.S. president will probably be a woman. This is a strong inductive argument, because if we assume the premise is true, the conclusion is well supported. But in this case, the premise is obviously false. Therefore, even though it's a strong inductive argument, it's uncogent. Uh, look at the next one. The sun has risen every day for as long as we know, so it will probably arise tomorrow. Right? Now, by risen, I mean the Earth is rotating and it appears to rise. Okay. <laughs> but again, this is a strong inductive argument. Um, the premises do provide good support. It's probably true that the sun will rise tomorrow. And um, it's also cogent because that premise is true. So we say it's a cogent inductive argument. And you could say strong and cogent, but cogent captures uh, the whole idea just by saying cogent. Okay, so on the last couple of pages, we have um, an exercise, right? And you may want to pause it here. I'm just going to read you the answers from what I have, okay? Uh, so number one is valid and unsound. Number two is valid and sound. Or you could just say sound for short. Um, and it's under most interpretations of mortal. Um, number three is invalid and therefore unsound. All right. Number four is valid and sound. Number five... Um, is valid and unsound. Okay. Number seven, skip to seven, is valid and unsound. Number eight is valid and sound. And that's assuming that Socrates is a person, not something, not, you didn't name your cat Socrates, right? <laughs> okay. And on the next slide, you see some inductive arguments. And again, you may want to pause it. Um, but number one, it seems to be strong and cogent. You know, assuming that the weatherman did say that today, uh, strong and cogent. Number two is strong and uncogent, right? Because um, for the past hundred years, it's, it, that first premise is just false, so it's strong and but yet but uncogent. And then number three is strong and cogent. So there you have it. On the last page, we see the chart again. And when I was first learning this, this um, graph, this chart, this visualization helped me remember what all these words meant and it was no longer so um, overwhelming right because the bottom line is all these words and we could add more to this little graph but all these words are just about even how you evaluate arguments the two ways you evaluate arguments and that is you look at the inference right where you assume the premises are true and you ask if the conclusion follows or is well supported depending on deductive or inductive and then you just look at the premises and say, are they true? Are they false? Are they dubious? You know. Um, so again, just look at the inference and the uh, premises, and that's where all this vocab comes from. Thanks.